Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Davenport, Dean of Rockefeller Chapel, and it's my great honor to welcome you to this opening convocation. Students here in this magnificent building and your families and friends who are watching and cheering you on from the quadrangles. Class of 2020, this splendid day has arrived when you take your place as students at the University of Chicago. Congratulations. <laughs> Today, you join generations of scholars whose unquenchable thirst for knowledge has enriched all life. You will learn from those who teach you here, and also, significantly, you will learn from each other. You bring with you, as a class, an extraordinary variety of experience and diversity of background and it's our fervent hope that you will come to embrace a deep respect for one another as students and for all that you each represent in viewpoint, in scholarship, in identity, in being. We encourage you, each of you, to engage wholeheartedly with the life of the university and with the many new experiences that await you here, both inside and outside the classroom. May your quest for new understanding, new knowledge, be shaped by a sense of limitless horizon and of the depths of possibility within you. Families, as you leave your students here this day, and we know this is a big day for you. May your care continue to nourish them as they begin this new journey in this great place of learning. A journey of growth and of growing independence. A journey that will set them each on their own life's course to fulfill their individual promise and destiny. Please know that each of us here at the university and in the college will do all in our power to help them flourish, to make them wise. We know that you are immensely proud of them and we share your pride in their accomplishments and in all that they will become. And now with great pleasure, I introduce to you all Max Lightman, who is here to represent the alumni of the University of Chicago. Alumni play an extraordinarily important part in the life of the university and in the lives of our students. Max is here to make the beginnings of that connection for each of you and to receive the Class of 2020 banner. Max. Good afternoon. As Dean Davenport said, my name is Max Lightman. I am a member of the college class of 1999 and the Booth School of Business class of 2007. And it's my great pleasure to speak to you today as a representative of the alumni body. I've had the privilege for the last six years of serving on the university's alumni board, and I have the great honor for the coming year as serving as its president. On behalf of the board and on behalf of the Alumni Association and the over 160,000 living UChicago alumni who have come before you, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this community. By enrolling here and being here today, you will forever be a part of the University of Chicago alumni body, and we're thrilled to count you among our ranks. So 21 years ago this week, I, I was sitting where you were at, at an opening convocation in this very chapel. I remember it vividly. I remember even where I was sitting. I don't remember it being quite this warm in the building. I know there were not, not every seat was not filled and the seats behind me were not filled. So we were, a, we were a bit smaller by about 600 students. But thinking back on that, what can I tell you? I can tell you that what the next several years that you're here will be one of the great adventures of your life. 
you will have experiences and stories that you'll remember forever. You'll meet faculty members and members of the staff who will be lifelong mentors to you and lifelong friends as well. You'll meet classmates who will become your closest friends for life. You may meet someone here who you start a business with. You may meet someone here who becomes your partner in business or law. And you may even meet your future spouse or partner here. I know it's somewhat cliche because Rob Reiner did a movie about it, although maybe it's not as cliche since that movie was made before you were born. But little did I know, to, as proof that it can happen, little did I know that 21 years ago, my future wife and best friend Julie was sitting somewhere here in this convocation with me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> I, I think she's watching on the stream, so she appreciates your, uh, your applause. <laughs> In many ways, the college experience is different and better than it was when I was a student here. In my second year in the college, the Metcalf Student Internship Program was founded. There were eight internships for the entire college, not the entire class of 99, but the entire college. And now you're, they're approaching 2,000 of them. No one in the class of 1999 had a living option even remotely close to Granville Grossman or North Campus or Max Pilevsky or the many other places where students live today. And I can tell you that your dining options are better by orders of magnitude. <laughs> and that's important. But I do know that there are many things about your college experience that are the same as they were two decades ago. I can guarantee you that while you're here, you'll be exposed to a world of ideas that change, the way you, that change the way you think. You'll be stretched in ways that you likely never have been before. You'll be tested in ways that you likely never have been before. And you may find that you're stressed in ways that you never have been before. But you will come out of that experience a better thinker and a more well-rounded person than when you came in. And because of that, and because of your association with this place, you'll have the credibility and respect of many. You're now part of a community that's unlike any other that you've likely been a part of before. There are over 160,000 people out there who call themselves University of Chicago alumni. Everywhere you go in this city, everywhere you go in this country, and in most countries around the world, you may encounter somebody who is a University of Chicago alumnus or alumna. All of us around the world are, invest, are invested in your success here and beyond Hyde Park. I hope you take pride in that association. I hope you use the alumni network to connect to those who have come before you. And in several years when you leave Hyde Park, I sincerely hope that you give back, come back, and connect to those who follow you who will be sitting in these seats in four years or in 21 years. We have the honor of being associated with one of the greatest universities in the world. Take advantage of that to the fullest extent possible. And with that, it's my pleasure to wish you best of luck and to present Alex Chung and Gabe Barone with the Class of 2020 banner. Take good care of it. It will be with you for a long time. I'm so sad, this is the last time I'm going to say this to you, but welcome to the University of Chicago. It's... <clears throat> I did tell you that everything was gonna work out, and now here you are. You are awesome. 
as individuals and as a class. Congratulations and get excited for an amazing four years. Yeah. Now, I know I should not say this, but um, you may be the best class I ever admitted. At least Cer certainly U.S. News seems to think so, and, uh, but try not to make the upperclassmen feel bad. Given your past accomplishments and fu future aspirations, I am certain you will make incredible contributions to our campus, and I look forward to seeing you and the impact you're going to make in the world after you graduate. So, President Zimmer, as the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid, I am pleased and proud to officially present to you Dean Boyer and the faculty, the outstanding class of 2020. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to add my uh, welcome to the enthusiastic welcomes you've already received. Uh, when welcome uh, the University of Chicago College class of 2020 and our new transfer students. Uh, it's likewise a pleasure to welcome uh, those parents of our new students who are here today on campus uh, for uh, they are also joining the University of Chicago community. Now, the University of Chicago is a distinctive institution uh, with a history of remarkable achievement and a particular view of and commitment to education and research. Most of us who have spent many years here, uh, and I am one of them, uh, believe there is no place that is more exciting, more challenging, more enriching, and no university that plays a more important role in the history and the landscape of American higher education, or indeed higher education around the world. I'd like to say a few words about why this is, uh, and what this will mean for your experience here as students in the college. And I would like to also say a few words about why we believe that you who are about to enter the college are just the right students to be here and the important role that you will play in this community. The University of Chicago is an institution driven from its very inception by an idea an idea that one could create and continuously renew a university that was focused on rigorous, intense inquiry and analysis. And the university, through its work every day, expresses the view that clarity derives from the clash of ideas and the willingness to accept answers only when they meet the tests of argument. We believe that the best education and the most empowering education takes place in the environment of constant challenge that is implicit in this culture of rigorous inquiry, and that this culture is responsible for producing ideas of power and importance to humankind. This focus on rigorous inquiry has defined the University of Chicago, its research and its education at every level since its beginning, and it continues to do so today. Now, what does this culture of inquiry really mean? And it's useful to illustrate with an example. So as the word inquiry itself implies, let's begin with a question. Namely, what are you doing when you're engaged in a discussion? What's the point of argument? Now, if you're like many people, uh, the purpose is to convince the other person that they have it all wrong and that you have it all right. And we certainly have all at one time or another engaged in such argument. Uh, however, for our work at the university, that is not really the point of discussion or argument. That point is rather to take the issue in question and explore arguments from all perspectives. Which arguments are valid under what circumstances? Which stand scrutiny? What are their power and what are their limitations? How do they relate? How do they comport with various data? and so on. The goal is greater clarity about all arguments from all perspectives on the issue. Embedded in this approach is the understanding that most often all arguments do not point in the same direction, and the given argument's power and its limitations must be understood 
simultaneously. Problems are complex. There are systemic interactions. Single actions have both benefits and undesirable consequences and uncertainties. Seemingly simple assertions can have complex implications. Arguments apply with more power in some circumstances and are more limited in others. New data can always emerge and must be sought. The more one argues and discusses, the more data that are brought to bear, related questions raised and analyzed, and perspectives incorporated into the analysis, then the fabric of understanding becomes richer and the approach to the problem becomes more nuanced. So in our culture of inquiry, understanding becomes complex, expandable, and fluid rather than simple and rigid. Uh, I do want to emphasize that this approach is not at all equivalent to saying that all arguments have merit. In fact, quite the contrary. This approach does assert that all arguments, no matter how comfortable, require scrutiny and explicitly recognizes the difficulty of establishing merit in arguments. Now, another feature of the intellectual environment at Chicago is that problems are taken on their own terms. And by this, I mean that many problems do not present themselves neatly along the lines of traditional and important disciplines. Now, this is not to devalue the disciplines. On the contrary, the disciplines provide important developed modes of inquiry that have great explanatory power. However, they also have limitations. And for many important questions, one must understand and bring to bear the depth of perspective of several disciplines. This intellectual porosity and multidisciplinary engagement are other key aspects of the University of Chicago emanating directly from the integrity of our approach to inquiry. Intellectual porosity also has a significant impact on what it feels like to be a member of the University of Chicago community. As a mathematics faculty member for many years, I was always aware of being part of a much larger institution with a commitment to inquiry and a corresponding sense of its own mission. The University of Chicago never feels like an intellectual holding company for disparate disciplines. It has a sense of wholeness and unity of purpose that is very distinctive. The core curriculum, a source of innovation in higher education whose values continue to resonate is one realization of this unity of purpose. And I'm confident that you will come to share this sense of the university. Now, in order for you as students to most benefit from and best contribute to this environment, you must develop the skills and approach of holding competing perspectives in your mind simultaneously, listening to the arguments of others and both understanding and challenging them. At the same time, you must challenge your own assumptions, and naturally this is often the hardest part, while ultimately still forging your own synthesis. It is a level of thought and analysis that leaves the simple who is right and who is wrong far behind. Here at the University of Chicago, you'll find that an argument must stand on its own and will not necessarily hold up to scrutiny simply because it is common or popular. What you will discover is a community that finds intense and rigorous engagement tremendously exciting, enjoying, challenging, empowering, and gratifying with a great sense of community and commonality around this distinctive experience. Now, entering this community, meeting so many new people and engaging new challenges, as you know, now are, is exciting, but certainly at the beginning, it may also be a bit intimidating. You'll need to find uh, yourself taking some risks, engaging in conversation and debate, and being open-minded to what others are saying. You'll learn a great deal from your early engagements, from your fellow students, from the faculty, and you will likewise contribute a great deal. It may not all come together immediately or easily, but this exploration and experimentation will be part of the entire learning process. And I'm totally confident that you will soon find your footing and discover, in fact, you can do all of this very, very well. I want to return to one word I just used, namely empowering, and briefly discuss another question, which is why exactly 
is education in the University of Chicago environment so empowering as so many of our students ultimately become alumni found for generations? To begin to answer this, let's look at a bit at the difference between action and analysis. Action has an either-or quality. Taking action can lead to intended benefits and a desired end, but sometimes to undesirable consequence and a number of certainties, uncertainties as well. What would be the best way to approach taking such an action? With simple and confident belief that one is right and all is for the best, or with the habit of mind to realize that in many cases, all the arguments for a particular action are not on one side, and that one can understand and anticipate the full context and consequences of an act, the downside as well as the upside. What the analytic culture of inquiry at Chicago provides is a lifelong set of skills and approach to the world that eschews simplicity and comfort in favor of analysis, inquiry, and the recognition of complexity. It empowers appropriate action because it strives to understand its full implications. In fostering the habit of questioning, it simultaneously fosters imagination and creativity of action. It is this approach that has empowered so many of our students over the years and provided the environment for our faculty research. It is what has empowered our faculty and alumni to challenge conventional wisdom define new disciplines, make imaginative and creative contributions to almost every domain of human endeavor, to assume leadership positions throughout the world, and in fact, to change the world. And it will do this for you as well. Uh, diversity has a very particular role at the University of Chicago. In a very clear way, the nature of questions being asked and perspectives being expressed are often a function of the experiences, background, and outlooks of those participating. Diversity for the university is therefore particularly germane and intrinsic to our core mission. We must ensure that our scholarly and education community is comprised of a rich mix of individuals who through their own distinctive viewpoints contribute to the intellectually challenging culture of inquiry of the university. Now the university's history reflects this openness. The university has, unlike many of our peer institutions, always been open to women as well as men. The first doctorate earned by a black woman in the United States was awarded in 1921 at the University of Chicago. We were among the first major non-historically black universities to tenure a black faculty member. Contributions by Asian American scholars in the 1920s were essential to the university's landmark research in sociology at a time when other elite institutions systematically discriminated against Jews. The University of Chicago refused to set quotas. We've long been a magnet for students from Mexico and South America, and today our Odyssey and No Barriers programs and other financial aid programs are designed to ensure that we remain accessible and attractive to outstanding talented students from low and moderate income families and that these students have the capacity to take full advantage of their time here at the University of Chicago. Throughout its history, the university has acted on the belief that the capacity to contribute was not limited to some specific groups, and very importantly, in addition, that the richness of the community directly contributed to the richness of the intellectual environment. The university that you're entering has been built by many persons over more than a century. Every generation and thousands of individuals have made contributions to its strength, culture, achievements, and vitality. Each of us at the university today, faculty, students, administrators, and staff, are the beneficiaries of those who came before us, who gave to the university through their work, their commitment, their financial contributions, and their advocacy. It is this legacy that we all inherit together, and it is this legacy on which we will all build together. You will contribute to this legacy 
through your own work in the next four years in the college and through your continued engagement with the university after you graduate. You are becoming, starting today, part of the continuum of the history of this institution. A key part of this history is the singular role the university has had in maintaining open inquiry, supporting free expression, and the importance of ensuring that those in our community are free to express and to hear ideas, even if others find them uncomfortable or even objectionable. As part of the University of Chicago, it will be your responsibility to take part in and preserve this culture of openness and free expression. I focused a great deal on the culture of inquiry at the university because this is, to my mind, the defining feature of this university and the educational experience of all its students, but it is not the only feature. Your analytical, analytic work will not exist in a vacuum, nor does the university exist in a vacuum. The university presents a myriad of opportunities to sit your, situate your work in a larger set of activities and to pursue your interests, whether they be connected to the arts, social engagement, fitness, athletics, or more. Likewise, we're fortunate to live in an extraordinary city with enormous opportunities, and we're residents of the south side of Chicago, a community of which the university is a highly committed citizen and a very proud member. All of the opportunities presented on campus and in the city can contribute to and dramatically enrich the nature of your total experience at the University of Chicago. So this is something about the university. Now what about you, our students entering the college this fall? You've come from all over the world with a wide variety of backgrounds, interests, and ambitions. But most importantly, you have convinced us that you are exactly the right students who can most contribute to and most benefit from the culture I've described. You have convinced us by the work you have done, the presentation you have made of your abilities, interests, and outlook, the recommendations of those who know you well, and your demonstrated commitment that you will be wonderful and full members of the University of Chicago and all that that entails. It is for all, this, all these reasons that the University of Chicago and all that it represents has chosen to invest in you. The university community that you join is comprised of your fellow students in the college and beyond the college, the university's faculty, administrators, and staff, our trustees, alumni, and committed friends, our students and alumni parents, and those who have been here before us as faculty members and administrators. And it will soon enough include those who come after you. It is a community of enormous energy, excitement, challenge, and enjoyment in ongoing mutual learning. And while you are, of course, focused on the next four years, you are entering a community that you will be part of for many, many years to come. Before closing, I do want to say a few words to the parents who are on campus and listening. Uh, having been through this myself three times, I have three sons, I know that sending one's children off to college is not a simple act. It's exciting, although a bit anxiety provoking. It's an act of significant financial commitment. It's also an act of trust. Trust in your children, that they will take advantage of the extraordinary opportunity that college affords them. Trust in yourselves that you have done your job to this point as parents and can watch and hopefully enjoy your children's growth in this next phase of life. And of course, trust in the institution that they attend. You are entrusting us at the University of Chicago with the education of your children, now our students. I know that for most of you, there is nothing more important. And likewise for us, at the University of Chicago, there is nothing more important. So to new students and parents alike, welcome to the University of Chicago. It is for all the reasons I've described, a university like no other, where you will have an education like no other. 
You're now part of this extraordinary and distinctive community with its remarkable legacy and its remarkable future. This will be a great adventure. Congratulations and enjoy it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Boyer. I have the honor to speak to you today as your dean and as a professor in the Department of History. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit this afternoon about the college and about the university and about the city to which you've come to live. Shaler Matthews, who was a, an early faculty member in the Divinity School, tells the story in his autobiography of arriving at the university on opening day of 1894 when most of uh, what is now the campus was still what he called an unredeemed prairie. The place was disorganized. Uh, many of our magnificent buildings were unfinished or not yet built. But Matthews recalled that none of that mattered to him and to his fellows since, quote, the air was charged with enthusiasm and hope, end quote. And I think opening day is a time of hope. It's a time of enthusiasm. It's a time of pride. And on such days as this one, I think one really does understand the power and the responsibility of these extraordinary communities that we call universities. Now, I can imagine that many of you sitting in the chapel this afternoon uh, are a bit anxious, a bit anxious about the place to which you've come and about your fate over uh, the next four years here. About the second issue, about your personal futures, 
I want to reassure you because you would not be here today if we were not confident that you will be extraordinarily successful in the college. Now, that said, some of us do need to worry, um, perhaps as an edge so that we can perform in a maximal way. And if you're like that, then you should feel free to continue to worry. But you really don't need to worry because you will flourish and you should relax, enjoy these coming days, particularly this week, and know that, to paraphrase the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, that your, your character already defines your destiny. In joining this particular community, you become a member of one of the world's great universities, not only because of the scholarly ancestors whom you can now claim, and because of the distinguished women and men who will teach you, but because you yourselves will add to the reservoir of talent and interest and commitment that is at the core of any serious university. Universities are among the oldest institutions of our culture and our civilization. They date from the 12th century in Europe, where students and teachers gathered in cathedral schools to pursue common interests in learning with new matriculants, seeking out and getting to know as the late medieval Manualis Scholarium, which was a manual relating to the organization of universities in the Middle Ages, as this text put it in 1481, getting to know professors and more senior students who were good and keen and who have individual ideas. And over the course of the centuries, the universities in Europe and America and elsewhere in the world have been sources of great social and cultural continuity and authority, but also radical intellectual and scientific change. Our university emerged from such a conjuncture of continuity and change, and its history reveals a remarkable interweaving of competing ideals. Chicago is one of the first modern research universities in the United States, which meant that it was an institution devoted to a professional scientific culture and to the rigorous competitive and meritocratic standards, meritocratic standards of a new national scholarly community that was emerging in the United States at the end of the 19th century, just around the time that we were founded in 1890. But if it, was a, if it was a new university for scientific purposes, it was created in 1890 from the ruins of a failed Baptist college first founded in the 1850s. And the men and the women who refounded our university, they refounded it in 1890, were, were profoundly dedicated to a rigorous teaching mission and to a pro program of public enlightenment for the citizens of the city. Our founding president, William Rainey Harper, conceived of a university that would include both an undergraduate college for men and women, equally open to men and women, a preparatory school for that college, what we t what t today call the laboratory school, an extension division for adult education, a university press publishing both scholarly books and learned journals, professional schools, and a graduate school of the arts and sciences model on the great research universities of Germany. And he staffed it with a faculty of 120 eminent scholars, this is in 1890, almost a third of whom had studied at various German universities. Harper thought of our community as being one university and that he wanted that all, all of those associated with the university would be devoted to intellectual excellence and to the cultivation of practical reason in our collective and in our individual lives. And from its founding, Chicago was unique for it was a place without crippling boundaries. Of course, the university came to have organizational units, departments and committees and so forth, and it even had a territory defined by street grids. But in fact, these were secondary to its primary mission. For the original impulse behind the university was to constitute a community of research and teaching in which all members, all members, shared common values committed to the passions of reason. Harper's driving ambition was to create a research university in which collegiate education, undergraduate education, would be integrated with the work of research and scholarship. He not only wanted an institution doing what he called real university work, and infused with what he called the university spirit, by which he meant that it should be a place that was fiercely devoted to the generation of new knowledge. But he believed that undergraduates, that college students like yourselves, should share fully in the deliberations of that spirit and that they then should use their educations to transform and improve the public welfare. Research was salutary in this model, not only as a way to advance new knowledge, but as a way of demonstrating, demonstrating to the citizens of the nation, the citizens of Chicago, the creativity of the faculty, the creativity of the students, and of mobilizing the university to enrich society. Harper saw our university as a sacred place, and he spoke of it in, the, in these terms, as a sacred place. 
and that searching for truth, in searching for truth, we join with the spirit of a bene beneficent providence. He viewed our community as an engine to do good in the world. He believed that America needed democratic prophets who would proclaim its righteousness, democratic priests who would ensure its collective cooperation and loyalty, and democratic philosophers who would help to guide its political and social self-understanding. The modern university, in his mind, was well fitted to play all three roles by its commitment to truth-telling, its dedication to reason dialogue, and its ethos of disciplined inquiry. Now, these foundational values, which really defined and, 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 and gave birth to our university in the 1890s, were further elaborated, but also modified during the, the Great Depression in the 1930s and 1940s, and the second great moment in our, our history during the presidency of Robert Maynard Hutchins. In contrast to the optimism and the self-confidence of the Gilded Age, that's the period before World War I, the faculty now in the Depression faced a world marked by economic and social crisis, by fear of the giant isms, socialism and communism and collectivism, fascism and totalitarianism, and by a profound need to defend individual autonomy and freedom against these ideological biases. Influential faculty, faculty leaders called for a more systematic and a more rigorous approach to liberal education that would reinforce the university's own academic uh, mission. As a prominent economist at the time, Leon C. Marshall put it in 1928, our educational standards should be those of an educational powerhouse and not those of an educational cafeteria. And then in the midst of the Great Depression, kind of ground zero in the Great Depression in 1930, a group of colleagues at Chicago revolutionized the world of higher education by creating Chicago's first core curriculum, our first core curriculum. This was officially designated the new plan, and this core was a bold attempt to synthesize broad fields of knowledge, including the natural sciences, as well as the humanities and social sciences, in an explicitly, explicitly interdisciplinary framework of general education for first and second year students in the college. Our core was a revolutionary curriculum, but it was more than that. It was a sign of new times, born in a historical moment of profound but fruitful crisis. It was the true progeny of a great university because it assumed that scholarly professionalism would inform the teaching of first and second year students in general education. It also assumed that students should begin with general rather than specialized knowledge. That's what will happen to you and that the first two years of college should be devoted to a very different conceptual and developmental set of purposes than the second. And this two plus two structure, this two plus two structure, the first and second years being rather different than the second, third, and fourth years of our college, still obtains today, and it fundamentally shaped the subsequent history of our college, and in many remarkable ways, it has also defined the relationship between our college education and the doctoral education we offer our graduate students. If the university embraced the dream of modern scientific research as its fundamental mission in the 1890s, it now, in the 1930s, more fully understood the value of general education in the liberal arts as a second and equal mission. Rather than training fixed persons for fixed duties with incantations of past dogmas, however pleasing, the founders of our core believed that it was the obligation of the modern university to educate flexible minds who would welcome intellectual exploration and see through the allures and the temptations of the rigid, doc rigid doctrinal systems and the stridency of irresponsible political leaders who were awash in the world of the 1930s. In challenging our youngest students to engage large areas of human knowledge and discovery at a high level at the very beginning of their careers in college, the general education courses of our core contributed mightily to the intellectual seriousness with which we endowed the whole of our college and indeed the whole of the university. Now, the new plan was our first core curriculum. It wasn't the last. Our current curriculum owes much to the spirit and the practices of the new plan. In contrast to other attempts at general education before World War II, Chicago's efforts did not seek to civilize the unwashed, to assimilate the unskilled, or to remediate the incompetent. The core had no political agenda then, just as it has none now. Robert Maynard Hutchins once rightly said of our university that the university has never had any ax to grind and it has refused to be a grindstone for anybody else. In our time, in our time, also a moment of great social and political upheaval, the skills and the scholarly and habits instilled by the core are essential in a new way. 
similar to those who espoused the Gilded Age optimism and progressivism of Harper's era in the 1890s, and to those who felt themselves assaulted by the easy ideological solutions to the profound crises of the 1930s, we find ourselves entangled in an equally fascinating historical era of massive and ever accelerating social change and frightening political upheavals. Our era is defined by rapid worldwide movements of people, ideas, and economic forces, by the weakening of traditional social loyalties and political identities, and by the pro proliferation of purely technical knowledge on the one hand and the oppressive domination of social media on the other. These forces can all too easily discourage or even defeat the human capacity to live one's life and indeed to govern one's community in a manner that is measured, thoughtful, and ethical, but is also responsive and also responsive to the global forces at play in our lives every day. In contrast to other American universities who abandoned attempts at general education in the 1960s and 1970s, giving into faculty particularisms and candidly also to student consumerisms, Chicago stayed the course, believing that it is the faculty's responsibility to design a holistic curriculum that moves from the general to the specific, that encompasses wide domains of human learning and wisdom, and that works at an intellectual level worthy of a great university. In this crucial historical moment, and we do live in a crucial historical moment, we remain committed to the educational practices of general knowledge for an educated citizenry. And throughout our curriculum, we seek to confront the turbulence of our age with the skills that make intellectual engagement with uncertainty possible and that cultivate in our students and our faculty a willingness to think rigorously, as rigorously and as flexibly as our age surely demands. A curriculum is more than a set of formal prescriptions and requirements. It is a statement of the basic values of a university in a way by which the faculty is forced to, to decide what is educationally important and what is not. But the core and the other elements of our curriculum only work because of the gifted students, like yourselves, who make it work. And from the very outset, the university attracted a remarkable group of students. As early as 1902, Harper was able to observe that, quote, an ability to organize work and skill of ad adaptation of means to end and determination of purpose to win and readiness to make sacrifice for the sake of intellectual advancement. No body of students, no body of students ever gathered together in this country or in any other country has shown itself to superior to the student body of the University of Chicago. What is most characteristic of our university is that the academic culture of our undergraduate students and the academic culture of our faculty substantially overlap, both based on a bracing commitment to merit and to achievement. This is a very, rather rare and special circumstance and is one that is the envy of colleagues at other universities and colleges. Like the great cosmopolitan cities of the 19th century, the great universities of our time are what one scholar has called publics of private people. They are institutions of specific national cultures, often located in great cities, but they are also inherently cosmopolitan. They are not schools in, in, in that we do not seek to teach fixed dogmas, but rather as the founder of the University of Berlin, Wilhelm von Humboldt once said, they exist to nurture, nurture both teaching and research in the cause of intellectual discovery, so much so that the teacher no longer exists for the sake of the student, but both the teacher and the student exist together. The teacher and the student exist together for the sake of scientific discovery. The great research universities of America are among the most constructive institutions that we have for defending the cultural values to sustain a civilized world order. Not only do our best universities train the young to engage in responsible citizenship, but by defending the culture of academic freedom, they guarantee access to scientific experimentation they help with intellectual character formation, and they protect a respect for conflicting ideas and even conflicting values. They have far surpassed the possibilities of the older German models from the 19th century, and ironically, in our case, Chicago has brought those earlier models to what I believe to a, be a kind of stunning completeness. Some years ago, Richard von Weizsäcker, who was then the president of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, spent a day touring our campus meeting with faculty and with students like yourselves. And at the end of the day, I asked him, Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, what are your impressions of the University of Chicago? And President Weizsäcker paused, pondered the question, uh, question for a while, and then with a kind of gleam in his eye, he quipped, well, 
Well, I'm truly delighted that after all these years, I've finally seen a real German research university. Now having, wel now, having welcomed you to our college, let me welcome you to the local context of our university, the city, the city of Chicago. It is no accident that great universities and great cities often coexist. In coming to Chicago, in coming to the city of Chicago in 2016, you will experience what generations of past students have experienced at this great university set in a remarkable city, creative and demanding intellectual citizenship at a local institution, but with broad and universal horizons. Our students, both women and men of all ethnicities and religious confessions, came and come from a broad spectrum of social backgrounds. And once here, they have fostered a deeply personal connection. Each of you will foster a deeply personal connection with the wider urban fabric of the city of Chicago. The diversity of cultural perspectives, the plurality of social views, and the rich fabric of cultural and artistic opportunities provided by the great metropolis of Chicago itself have been crucial over the past century to our ability to enhance our capacity to assemble, to sustain, and to empower such a diverse student body with a highly pragmatic outlook on life. The relationships between integration and diversity, between homogeneity and pluralism, that now fill the strident debates that we observe in our public discourse about immigration and about globalization, find no better living example than the history of this great city. From the beginning, Chicago was a destination for immigrants in the modern world, and no better example exists to prove, in my view, in my personal view, the legitimacy and the positive contributions that immigrants have made and continue to make to our nation. As late as 1890, the first and second generation Germans constituted almost a third of the population of our city, and in many neighborhoods, their language, rather than our English, was the principal language of commerce and administration. Upon their heels came the Irish and the Poles, the Lithuanians and the Swedes, the Norwegians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Italians, the Russians, the Greeks, and many others. And during the Great Migration between 1910 and 1960, hundreds of thousands of talented African-American citizens journeyed from the American South to become citizens of the city of Chicago. And after the Second World War, Chicago welcomed still growing Indian, Filipino, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, and Vietnamese communities and the last 50 years have also seen the emergence of a huge and proud Latino community of peoples from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Even today, the city assembles onto itself a vast array of individuals and families from around the world. Chicago began as a frontier trading post in the 1830s, but it had become by 1900 a global crossroads, the fifth largest city in the world. And the history of this university reflects that development the enormous population growth of our Chicago, driven by immigration in the later 19th century, was accompanied by the assemblage of great wealth, and after 1880, by the emergence of civic and economic elites determined to provide our city with cultural institutions appropriate to a world city. This American progressive faith in science and the conviction that the organization of knowledge might guarantee the progress of society made our civic leaders in Chicago equally interested in higher education. And the founding of your university is thus an integral part of those final decades of the 19th century when the civic leadership of Chicago had attained a critical mass of self-confidence and self-esteem necessary to associate public virtue with the fortuitous combination of scientific knowledge and philanthropic wealth. Your university thus owes much of its character and its financial support to your new hometown. Chicago is a wonderful, it's an amazing city with a history that has both defined and often uh, defied its own fate, a city that is the metaphor for American civilization in the 20th century. It is not simply that this is a city with a rich and colorful political history that, that detests losers, and that, as one local political wag once put it to a would-be reformer, it doesn't want, any, doesn't want nobody that nobody sent. It's also a city whose confluence of cultures and ethnicities, languages and religious values, cited far from the distractions or the illusions of either ocean coast on the boundary line of the great American West has given the city a personality of its own, great resilience and determination, pragmatic impatience with what was accomplished yesterday, and yet a deep and productive tolerance for diversity and for difference. Many years ago, Nelson Algren, the famous Chicago novelist, called Chicago a, quote, big shot town, a small shot town, a jet-propelled, old-fashioned town built by old world's hands with new world tools. 
And even today, to see the many luminous skyscrapers of the central city at dusk as the sun sets along the shores of Lake Michigan is to know that those hands and those tools have built a city like no other in our time. And finally, a word of greeting and congratulations to the parents present in the Harper Quadrangles this afternoon. My wife Barbara and I have seen three children through college, and we've also experienced the joy that comes from all parents who see their children mature and grow and in due time empty their dorm rooms and graduate. I realize you just moved into your dorm rooms, but eventually you will move out. Uwe Omer, the contemporary photographer and the author of the family album of the planet Earth, has observed about his encounters with the thousands of contemporary families around the world that, quote, I learned that there's one thing, there's one thing in every single family in the world, the hope of parents to be able to give their children, to give their children a better education than what they had for themselves. A better education than what they had for themselves. Now, realistically, of course, none of us can give our children an education. Only you can do this. But you have made it possible for your children to give, yourself, give themselves the best education. And for that, I think you deserve to be warmly congratulated. The process of going to college is a complicated one for all parents, you as well as me. We do our best to advise our high school seniors about the selection of colleges. And then we live through those, we live through those anxiety-filled months, <coughs> excuse me, waiting for the famous thick envelope. So I, I gather nowadays the, the thick emails that uh, our colleagues in admissions send out to the select few. And at the end of this complex human journey, we end up sitting in a beautiful neo-Gothic cathedral or neo-Gothic harbor quadrangles, much like that experienced by the students of the 12th century cathedral schools, saying goodbye. On such an occasion, parents are filled with enormous pride, and yet also with sadness about the pass passing of generations and of time itself. Time is a cunning, and it is an inescapable thing. It has its own reasons, and it has its own logic, and it brings changes that often enrich, but they never fail to complicate our lives. That your daughters and your sons are here today is their doing, for it was they who worked hard in high school, it was they who used their talents and ways that merited them the opportunity, indeed I would say the privilege, to become members of one of the great universities of the world. Your children will certainly flourish in the college, and I have no doubt that three years from now, plus nine months, President Zimmer and I will see all of you back on the quadrangles for Senior Class Day, the bookend event for graduating seniors, the bookend event to the current um, uh, event, that brings uh, the studies of our seniors to a conclusion. You will be full of admiration for your sons and daughters' accomplishments and success, and having even greater love, if such is possible, for their generosity and for their humanity. But they would not be here today without your help, without your encouragement, without your financial sacrifices, and above all, without your love. And so as the dorm rooms are put in order, and as the time comes to say goodbye, but of course only until family weekend in late October, I'm sure that I speak for all of our students, as I speak for myself and for my colleagues, when I tell you that we are enormously grateful for your conviction that higher education matters and that it is extremely valuable to the lives of our children and indeed to the future of our nation. Now, now it is our venerable custom that we must divide. After the Motet Choir sings the alma mater, I'm going to ask the students of the class of 2020 and the transfer students of 2016 to proceed to your class photograph, after which you'll re return to your residence halls and have a splendid dinner with your fellow class members. And it gives me a very special pleasure to invite the parents and other relatives and friends of the class of 2020 to join President Zimmer and other members of the college alumni, faculty, and administration for a reception in the Hutchinson Courtyard. Let me close by wishing all of you a, an exciting and stimulating year, one filled as our Medieval ancestor wrote in 1481 with good and keen teachers and students and with a rich treasury of individual ideas. Again, welcome to a great university, the University of Chicago. Who soldiers and who sons now?